Okay, I think everybody's left, so I would say we will start. So welcome everybody to the today's Move to Launch event. So we have some few delays, but today it will happen, hopefully. So great that you're all here. Thank you very much to the Move 2 members who are here, to all guys from the LRT, to Professor Walter, and all guests who have invited by the Move 2 members. So at 90.32, hopefully we see a great launch, uh, but up to there is still some time left and we have a few great presentations before. And to guide you a little bit to the evening, we are here to help. And next to me is Lucas, the momentum student lead from Move2, and he will be there the whole evening for you. Yeah, thank you, Linda. So this is Linda. Um, she's part of uh, Mission Control. So there they want to control the satellite and operate the satellite in the near future, so from tomorrow on. And yeah, she's also part of the PR team. Yeah, and we will accompany you throughout this evening. Yeah, and um, for all the Move2 students, that is a very special day because like 200 students were working for three years um, to build the satellite and to develop it and to test it. That took such a long time for us. And tonight, finally, this satellite will launch into space. So for all the people who don't know uh, Move2, oh, that's no one's looking. Um, yeah, for all the people who don't know Move2, that is actually a very small satellite, so a CubeSat, we call it. It's only a weight of one kilogram, but it has all the functionalities of a very big satellite. So um, that's actually our um, satellite project, and that was built by the students of the VAR satellite technology. And yeah, now we want to celebrate together the um, launch event of the Move2 satellite. And that's basically... <laughs> okay. And here you can see um, that's on a Falcon 9 rocket. Um, here you can see a picture of it with a lots of um, patches around. So that's very important in satellites and satellite launches, lots of patches. And we will see it in via a live video uh, stream launch in the USA. So it's basically in California right now. And our satellite is on top of this rocket. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if you have any questions, you can ask us. Yeah, but because not all members can be here, we have a live stream to YouTube. Unfortunately, our camera is broken, so no video, but they all get our presentations. So hello to everybody who is there on the internet. We are happy that you are, you are there too, uh, and you hear our voices and see the presentations. So hopefully you get a little bit of the feeling what we are doing today. So then we start with the program we have tonight. So um, yeah, the first point, yeah, the welcoming. And but the first really interesting part is the Move to Movie premiere. So that was a project by the PR team that we have right now. And in the last weeks, they prepared a movie for us. So we were very excited to see that. Then we will have a small coverage of our first move overpasses. So for all who don't know it, so first move was the predecessor of the satellite move two, and it's actually in space and we can s watch the overpasses, um, at least the beeping sound we can hear then. There, and afterwards we have a great um, short introduction why we fly to space by Professor Walter. We are really thank you, thankful for having you here tonight. <laughs> and yeah, of course we will have a move to introduction so that all the people who don't know move, who no, don't know um, the teams and the subsystems, they will get an introduction there. Yeah, then we have some MOVE members who are still there in California and we will call them via Skype and hopefully they can tell us a little bit about the feeling there at the moment. Mm -hmm. And on our rocket there is not only MOVE2 but also other satellites and we will hear something about the ECU satellite that also some MOVE members um, took part in that project so then we will hear something about that project. And then the most interesting part of the evening will begin. We will watch the SpaceX webcast for the launch and of course the launch itself. So this is the most important part, I would say, of the whole evening. Yeah. 
And after that, um, when we have seen the launch of Move2, we will hear a bit about the history of Move2, what happened and what happened until now, so that we have the one unit cube set we've built so far. And then, of course, we want to know what's happened next. That's also a question that we will hear afterwards. Yeah, and in, in about um, two and a half hours, we will have the official ending. And so that's the overview of our program that we have tonight. And now we will start right away with our Move to Movie premiere. So as I already said, that's a project from our PR team. And that's actually the first movie we have about our uh, Move to project that actually presents what the people or the students in our project are really doing. So we haven't seen it so far. All the Move members didn't see it today. So it's the first time for us to see it. So. Let's see on the movie. So that was the move to movie. Great applause for our PR team who prepared it. Okay, so now we have a very special opportunity because um, actually the predecessor, as I already said, first move is right now overpassing, so it's actually in field of view. And we will now see our ground station. That's a waterfall of our ground station. And we hope to see or oh, hope to hear the beeping sound that first move does uh, frequently. So actually, first move is not fully operational anymore, but um, it's actually transmitting its call sign, and that's um, that's basically just move one in Morse code that it's sending all the time. And if we are lucky, we can hear something. Maybe we can. So that's. Actually, every minute it's transmitting its call sign. So let's just wait. Oh. <laughs> just to be safe. Ah. Extend to one. 
was könnte da? So here in the middle you can see uh, that's the frequency where it's actually sending. So it's um, in megahertz uh, this frequency then. And now you see only noise. That's um, all the blue stuff around. And only the red parts are um, signals. So I'm not sure if that was in the middle a signal of uh, first move. So that's only noise we hear. Okay, then um, some people say that in the middle there was some s s small signal of the uh, first move, but we didn't hear anything. I'm not sure why. I think that's another signal that's not first move, I think. So that's uh, basically what we are doing tomo from tomorrow on to hear for a signal from move two. So we are looking on these spectras and hmm, is this a signal of move two? So let's just practice that one. Okay, and sometimes first move is not transmitting um, something, so it's um, unfortunately not very frequent in the last day, so... Ah, now you can hear it loud and clear. So that was move one. So applause! <laughs> yeah, let's hope to hear that also for move two then, from tomorrow on. So and now is the big question, why we fly to space? And former astronaut Professor Walter will tell us why. Thank you very much to being here tonight. <laughs> so I think now everybody is in the room. Because we are running a little bit out of time, we will do the Move 2 presentation a little bit later, so after the launch. And now we'll call our guys in Wannenberg and hopefully it will work. We will see. <laughs> Hello, can you hear us? Yeah, hi. Hi. Just a second. So, now I hear you louder. So, do you have video or just? Just a second. I'm not familiar with this new stuff. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there you are. Now we see you. Uh, yes. <laughs> Here we are. Somewhere over there is the rocket. Oh, great. So, so how's the mood over there? Hat er mich gehört? Let's see if I can find where. Uh, <laughs> there somewhere, I guess. But my video is very bad. Okay, great, thank you. So how's the mood over there? It was nice, the weather's good, the mood is nice. We're all excited. I can show you the group. Okay, yeah, Where? who are you? <laughs> Carl is still missing, but everybody wow. else is here and waiting. <laughs> so how many of you are there at the launch site? Sorry, didn't get that. How many of you are you there from the Move2 team in Wendberg right now? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six and a half. My wife is also here. So quite a lot move to members. So great. So you found How's the mood in Germany? Yeah. <laughs> nice. That's what I wanted to hear. So one important question. Do you have any clue about the delays we had beforehand? 
No, we don't. We just have the Twitter posts and the emails from ISL, and we don't know nothing more. Um, we just saw that the rocket was laying down yesterday the whole day because we went down to the beach and wanted to see it. And they took it down and just put it up in the evening again. So that you see some preparation already. Did you see today also some preparation? Maybe like they put the rocket back on the launch pad? It was already on the launch pad yesterday in the evening and we didn't see that. We have been there around noon at the beach and so we didn't see anything. We just saw empty launch pads. Did you see any other teams? So we have heard before and that there were a lot of other um, satellite missions on the rocket. Did you see someone? I know that a Korean team is also checked in in our hotel, but they have a big satellite and I didn't see any of them. Here at our viewing spot there are some Americans, but they are not from any satellite team. They're just here to see the launch. So it is windy over there or is there no wind? Because I see nearly no clouds, so it really looks beautiful, but is there wind? There is a slight wind up here. I don't know how it is at the beach. Usually at the beach is a little bit more, but I'm not concerned about any delays because of that. Okay, and um, in other terms, are you? how are you about the launch we have right now? What are your feelings about that? We are quite excited, all of them. We set up some cameras to film it. Everybody else set up some cameras. We will set up a live stream of SpaceX to be in time. So everything's fine from our side. Will you have any possibility to get maybe some beacons from our satellite? Sorry again. Do you have maybe some ground station or something like this to get the first beacons of the satellite? No, we don't have anything. We have an uh, amateur uh, guy who is uh, receiving something, but he's only receiving stuff from the, the airport and from SpaceX, so we can hear the countdown, but we don't know anything about receiving our satellite. We don't have anything here. So and what are your plans after the launch? We we'll go to Las Vegas and spend our, all our money there. <laughs> That's good, yeah. <laughs> so we, you had some free time because the launch was delayed. So what did you do in this time when you now have free time? <laughs> so with we, I mean me and my wife, we just traveled around whole California. We have seen national parks. We have seen LA, San Francisco. So it's very nice here. But the problem was we had to come back to Lompoc like every three days or so. Everybody in the hotel already knows us and they give us all the information they have. So we've just traveled around. Okay, great. So see a little bit of America. So then we hope you will get, have a great launch and maybe have a great video afterwards for us. And I think we will hear maybe later from you how it was. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you for the call, cross your fingers and have a good launch. Yeah, thanks. We all hope to have a good launch. <laughs> so, um, for our next point, it is planned um, to have a small presentation about the ECO team because um, there are more than one satellite on this rocket. As I said before, there are actually more than 60 satellites there. And there is another small satellite where some team members of MOVE2 had also part in. That is a project by the ESA that's called ISEO. And um, they will also launch tonight. And we hope to have also a great presentation now about the ISEO project. Thank you, Lukas. Thank you, Linda. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I think we'll just start ahead with the video that was made by ESA because I'm just one of the students in the team and not a proper ESA spokesperson, so let the professionals do their job. Uh, I think I heard a version with, with sound, but okay, I'll, I'll improvise. Um, so as we'll be on the same rocket, we'll be probably the same orbit. You can see ZEO is a little bit larger. Um, and we're going through the different subsystems there that are all built by uh, student teams across Europe. So this is the power distribution unit that was built in Hungary, um, which is one of the very first systems that turns on in order to stabilize the attitude, the orientation of the satellite in orbit. 
and it can do this by magneto talkers, by momentum wheels, and also by um, by thrust thrusters. Um, ideally, just the momentum wheels and the the magneto talkers will be enough. Um, these are all built by by different teams. Um, there is an experimental one, uh, a momentum wheel from the University of Bologna, and the other ones I think are like professional industry grade ones to, to make sure that it actually really works no matter what goes with the experiment. Then we'll have the um, amateur radio communication with the ground station. Um, there are two ground stations. The primary one is in Forli in Italy and the second one is in Spain. Uh, this is for the regular communication with the satellite to check its status, give, ne give it new commands. Um, yeah, I have to have to do this live. I don't know the order of the of the experiments. Um, I think you 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 will hear more about the orbit when the when the move two uh, talk is about. As I said before, it will be the very same orbit. Um, yes, there is another amateur radio payload on it. Um, MSAT UK has built a small unit on that uh, satellite that can communicate. Um, the idea is to provide schools and amateur radio enthusiasts around the world with, a, with an option to uh, receive the satellite. And we can also use this payload to downlink health and status information to ECO in case there is any issue with the main communication link. Um, there is a GPS receiver, a space-grade GPS receiver on board, built by the University of Bologna. So we can instantaneously have our position um, and the attitude as well with some space trackers, um, where there is a new software experiment by the University of Delft. Um, then on the bottom of the satellite, we have uh, a radiation probe, the Tritel radiation dosimeter. Uh, again, built in Hungary. These guys have been very busy in the mission. Um, I think the next one is there's another probe there, the Langmuir probe, that is measuring uh, ionization levels in the still slightly present atmosphere up there in space. Uh, again, also built uh, by, uh, by the guys in Hungary. Um, then there are cameras on board, uh, which are built in Estonia. Uh, so we'll be able to make pictures of the Earth and also transmit them back. So um, there are quite a few um, experiments on board that produce a lot of data that has to come down, and this is done by a separate S-band downlink, very similar to MOVE2. And that's the reason why I'm standing here, because um, Munich, in the city campus, on, on the roof of our institute, we have a, um, a ground station, a, a satellite antenna, that will be used as a primary downlink antenna for all experimental data of the satellite. And there is also a backup station in, Fo uh, in Forli, in Italy again. Uh, and now the last experiment, which is very exciting, is when, when it's time to say goodbye and the batteries are down. Um, there is a natural tendency for these satellites to come down over time, but as we've hear more and more in the, in the last years, uh, space debris is a big thing. And the sooner we can come down, the better. So there is a deployable drag sail that we can trigger. It will open up increase our uh, square area and just make it so that we can go uh, down even sooner. And I think now we're just repeating, or? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and now I've brought you, I think, three pictures. Um, yeah. Just to give you a little bit more insight uh, about our our part there because on the, in the video you just saw a little Google Maps ping on, on Munich just to give you an idea how that actually looks like. So this is in Munich on the city campus. You can see the, the church in the background. And on the roof we have our nice ground station with a KUKA robot, so proper space technology spin-off as we've learned today. Uh, it's the three meter dish and um, yeah, we use the robot arm to point towards the satellite and pick up the, the, um, the signals. And then uh, on the cables, we go down in our lab downstairs where we have a software-defined radio where we can pick up the signals and make them, make them into some digital signal that we can use, decode the data, and send it forward towards the, um, the experimental teams. 
And it's pretty much the same set of software that we have also used in Move2 by now. So there is a big cooperation between the two, two teams. Um, okay, I can't press to the next image, so maybe you do. Um, so just to give you an idea, this is um, a meeting that we had in October. This is um, representatives from all the SEO teams. We are 15 teams overall across Europe, and of course there are only a few representatives from each team. The overall team is much, much larger. Um, yeah, next picture, please. <laughs> uh, so this is just to give you an idea of the scale. We heard uh, already that Move2 is a CubeSat. Uh, it weighs one kilogram. Um, Move2 is a little bit bigger. It's 50 kilograms. It's 30 by 30 centimeters and 60 centimeters high uh, as it's here. And this is, uh, I think, the last day before it uh, was shipped off to, to the US where we got the chance to actually see it. And maybe to tell you a little bit about the timeline, uh, when I started studying in 2008, uh, the mission was already undergo. I joined it very enthusiastically. Uh, back then it was said the launch would be in 2011, so we already heard that three years might be some delay. You can think of seven years as a delay I already experienced. Uh, but I'm very happy that it's finally launching and we, that we can, can get data out of it. And I think that's the last picture, right? Um, yeah, thanks for your time. And if there are any questions, I think over the evening you can find me and, and ask questions. Thank you, Martin. So we have a little bit of time left before we the live stream will start. And now you have the chance to grab something to drink and some food. There are some stuff, and over there you can get some hot dogs. Um, if there's nothing left, just go to one of the MOVE members and tell them that they have to get the stuff from downstairs. And we will just start the live stream, and hopefully you all will be back in about 10 minutes when it will start.
stop the stop the night. Good morning from SpaceX headquarters here in Hawthorne, California. This morning's Falcon 9 launch is scheduled for 10.34 a.m. Pacific Standard Time or 18.34 Universal Coordinated Time. Our launch window is just under 25 minutes long and closes at 11 a.m. Pacific Time. I'm Lauren Lyons, a senior engineer in our flight reliability department, and welcome to the webcast for the Spaceflight SSS, sorry, SSOA Small, Small Sat Express mission. For this mission, we are flying a record 64 satellites for our customer spaceflight. This is the largest number of payloads ever launched from a US-based rocket. This flight is also particularly exciting for SpaceX for another reason. We'll be flying this Falcon 9 booster for the third time. Now, this is the first time we've ever done this, which we'll talk more about later on in the webcast. Following the liftoff, we have two recovery attempts. First, we are attempting to land Falcon 9's first stage on our autonomous spaceport drone ship just read the instructions, which is situated in the ocean 50 kilometers away from the launch pad. The second recovery attempt will be to catch our payload fairing with a large net on our boat, Mr. Steven, as that fairing descends down over the Pacific Ocean after separating from the second stage. And if you've been following us closely, you know that we're still early in our fairing catching efforts, but maybe today will be the day that we net one for the first time. And finally, once Falcon 9 reaches its intended orbit, the 64 satellites will be released in six separate deployments, starting at around T plus 14 minutes and ending approximately 43 minutes after liftoff. Now, because all of the deployments take place over areas of the globe where we do not have ground station coverage, there will be no live video feed of the spacecraft deployments on today's webcasts. So we'll wrap it up right after shutdown of the second stage engine, approximately 10 minutes after launch. However, we will be posting updates on Twitter about the deployments starting at when we regain ground station coverage around an hour later. Now let's take a look at Falcon 9 on Pat's Space Launch Complex 4 as we count down to liftoff. Hi, I'm Kate Tice and I'm a program reliability engineer here at SpaceX. We're looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket at our West Coast launch site, Space Launch Complex 4 East or Slick 4 East at Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is just a couple hours north of where I'm standing here at our headquarters in Los Angeles. Falcon 9 you see here is 70 meters tall, which is just over 21 stories high, and most notably, our first stage is covered in soot. As Lauren mentioned, this is the first time that SpaceX will be flying a Falcon 9 for the third time. So all of this that you see here is from not one, but two previous re-entry missions. Multiple reuse is being supported by our Block 5 upgrades that we debuted earlier this year. Uh, our Block 5 rockets are designed to be capable of 10 or more flights with no scheduled refurbishment. In fact, this stage that you see here previously supported the Bangabadu 1 mission in May of this year, which was our first Block 5 fight, flight, and that was then followed by the Mira Puti mission that was this past August. With a successful launch this morning, this booster will have launched from each of SpaceX's three launch, pla launch pads, Slick 40 and Launch Complex 39A, which are our two pads at Cape Canaveral in Florida, and now Slick 4 East at Vandenberg, uh, which makes today's mission the very first SpaceX launch pad hat trick. So in our 17 foot in diameter fairing here, we have 64 satellites. Um, as mentioned, this fairing will be, we will be attempting to recover it um, today. Hopefully today we can actually manage to snag it. Uh, this attempt we will be aiming to catch it and recover the fairing in the super size net that you see there uh, on our recovery ship called Mr. Steven. That's currently stationed in place out in the Pacific Ocean in preparation for today's attempt. Now we are early in our efforts to recover our fairings and if today is not successful we will continue to iterate until we get it right. The Falcon 9 and spacecraft teams are currently working no issues as we count down to liftoff in just over 10 minutes. At T minus one hour, the satellites were transferred to internal power, meaning they were no longer drawing power from the ground. And Falcon 9 has been loading propellants since T minus 35 minutes. Our fuel, RP-1, which is a rocket grade kerosene, is now fully loaded on the second stage. An RP-1 load on the first stage will close out six minutes before launch. 
super chilled liquid oxygen. That's our fuel's oxidizer. It's currently loading on both stages and we'll close out on stage one and stage two at T minus three minutes and two minutes respectively. The next major activity, which is happening at T minus seven minutes, is engine chill. This is when we open up the valves between the first stage propellant tanks and the nine Merlin engines in order to chill in the turbo pumps. We do this in order to make sure that when that full flow of super cold liquid oxygen hits the MET liftoff, there is minimal temperature difference, which avoids thermal shock to the hardware. The white truss structure next to the rocket, known as the transporter erector, or sometimes called the TE or strongback, it not only transports Falcon 9 from the hangar to the pad and raises it from horizontal to vertical, but it also routes fluids, powers, and telemetry lines to Falcon 9 and to the payload. At about T minus four and a half minutes, we will retract the TE away from the rocket slightly, providing clearance for Falcon 9 to lift off. Now regarding liftoff conditions, the range is currently green for launch, and we are tracking no weather constraints going into T0. The last weather balloon or wind balloon was released some time ago, and the upper altitude winds and ground winds are currently within loads limits. Today's mission is for our customer, Spaceflight. With 64 payloads being sent to space, Spaceflight SSOA SmallSat Express is an exciting mission. These include 15 microsats and 49 cubesats from both commercial and government entities from a total of 17 countries. This morning's mission will be headed to sun-synchronous low Earth orbit, which is what SSO stands for in the mission name. Sun-synchronous orbits travel over the Earth's poles as the planet rotates underneath, with the satellite passing over a particular section of the Earth at the same time each day. Sun-synchronous orbits provide a constant amount of sunlight, which makes them especially good for imaging satellites, of which there are several on today's flight. Let's check out this clip from Spaceflight with more info about today's payloads. At Spaceflight, our mission is to make space accessible to all. We provide the most opportunities anyone on the planet for small sats to get to orbit. The rideshare model makes space really accessible to everyone. This model lowers the barriers to entry for people that want to get small sats on orbit. And this enables all kinds of new business plans to come to fruition by really enabling lower cost launch for everyone. The SSOA mission was all about getting small sats on orbit. They've historically been relegated to the secondary payloads. We decided to fill a whole Falcon 9 with small sats, making it cost effective and therefore enabling new technologies, taking an unprecedented number of first time flyers up. We've got startups, ongoing businesses, space agencies, museums, universities, even a middle school aboard. Missions themselves vary from tech demonstrators to Earth observation, communications to biological experiments. Spacecraft come from 17 different countries represent the work of thousands of people. A mission this size with 64 spacecraft takes years of planning and draws on our deep expertise in launch. Our engineers designed two rings, the upper and lower free flyers, that will separate and deploy their spacecraft in a series of orchestrated maneuvers. Because we have launched over 140 satellites to date, we've experienced with nearly every different SEP system and dispenser and are always ready with custom solutions to deployment problems. Our engineers and mission managers were fully up to the challenge of a dedicated mission. Assembling the integrated stack was like putting together a giant, complex puzzle. It was a master effort in project planning, ingenuity, and perseverance that took place in our new state-of-the-art integration facility in Auburn, Washington. Our team also worked with our customers to navigate all the regulatory, licensing, and insurance challenges that come with putting a spacecraft on orbit. Particularly for our first-time flyers, making sure that everything is running smoothly is part of the turnkey service our mission managers provide. Finally, I'd like to say this would not have been possible without SpaceX and the incredible capabilities of the Falcon 9. We all envision a world where small sats are really making a difference. All kinds of applications, Earth observation, new lunar missions, space manufacturing, stuff we can't even dream about. We really want to say how grateful we are to Planet for being the primary on this mission, for SpaceX for enabling it to happen, and for all of our customers that are sharing this ride with us. As we mentioned, there are 64 satellites on board today. One of these payloads is part of a collaboration between the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, or LACMA, and artist Tavares Strachan called Enoch. Enoch highlights the story of Robert Henry Lawrence Jr., the first African-American astronaut. 
Lawrence passed away in 1967 in an airplane accident during astronaut training, and he was never able to realize his dream of going to space. The artist sought to honor this legacy by creating a 24 karat gold canopic jar, which is the same shape of jars used in ancient Egyptian mummifications. The jar has been mounted with Lawrence's bust on its top, as you can see there. The Enoch sculpture will be sent to orbit, and once in space, it will circle the Earth for seven years before deorbiting. SpaceX is a founding sponsor of LACMA's Art and Technology Lab, which sponsored the development of this project. We're now heading into the final countdown, so let's get a status update on the rocket. With just a few minutes to go before liftoff, everything is looking good on Falcon 9. Full fuel is fully loaded on both stages, and LOX is getting there as well. At T minus one and a half minutes, we will start vehicle gas closeouts. That's completion of all helium and nitrogen gas loading and the closing of all the valves to those systems. Around that time, you'll also see a large cloud of white gas coming out of the TE. This is expected. This is us venting out the liquid oxygen lines in, on the TE into the air, making sure that excess oxidizer isn't in the path of Falcon 9's plume at liftoff. At T minus one minute, Falcon 9 will go into startup. You'll hear that on the countdown net. This is when the vehicle stops listening to requests from the ground, other than an abort, of course, and instead is controlled by the flight computer from then on through launch. Now, as a reminder, if anyone calls a hold on the launch today, we will try again at a later date. Falcon 9 and the payload are currently tracking no issues. The weather is go, the winds are go, and the range is green for an on-time launch today. Now, with three minutes to go, Let's listen in on the countdown nets. That back igniter purge has started. Stage one lock slow and it's closed out. Stage two locks load just goes out. Falcon 9 is sort of. Stage 2 is pressing for flight. We'll launch your on countdown 1. We are going for launch. Closeouts are complete. Stage one, pressing for flight. T minus 15 seconds. Thank you. 
Falcon 9 has cleared the tower and is now headed upward on its mission to sun-synchronous low-Earth orbit. Coming up, the rocket will throttle down for max Q, which, rep which represents the maximum aerodynamic stress on the rocket. We're now headed into a series of events that will occur in rapid succession. That's Miko, stage separation, and SES-1, or second engine start one. Miko is the shutdown of all nine first stage engines in preparation for stage separation, where stage two separates from stage one, and SES-1 is the ignition of the second stage engine. Following SES-1, we will turn our attention back to the returning first stage, which will relight three of its engines in a boost back burn to head back towards the drone ship. And then finally, we'll see ferry fairing deployment at T plus two minutes and 43 seconds. As mentioned earlier in this webcast, we're attempt attempting to recover the payload fairing, and while we may not have a live video feed of this attempt, we'll share updates as they become available. So in about 20 seconds, you'll hear the call out from Miko. Let's listen in. A successful main engine cutoff, stage separation, as well as ignition of that second stage engine. And there goes that fairing. And there you can see all 64 of those satellites on stage two headed to sun synchronous orbit. You will hear the call up for the boost back burn ending in a couple of seconds. That's where stage one's burn that brings it back in the direction of the drone ship. That burn will, that burn will cease. Stage two trajectory nominal. And we are hearing that the stage two trajectory is nominal and performing as desired. You can see those beautiful grid fins popping up on the left side on stage one as it makes its way back down to the drone ship. In fact, D's power is nominal. That burn is looking very good. Stage two, impact D engine continues to look good. Temperatures and chamber pressures remain nominal. We have beautiful views of the Earth from both stages.
So just a quick recap in case if you have just joined us. We just had a beautiful liftoff from Vandenberg Air Force Base, uh, our West Coast launch site in California, followed by amazing footage of stage separation, main engine cutoff first, then stage S separation. And we see the second engine um, there ignited and carrying our payloads into the proper orbit. Now on the left side of your screen there, you see our first stage, which is coming back down to planet Earth uh, as we're hoping to land it on our drone ship uh, this morning. So coming up in just a few seconds, we'll be initiating the re-entry burn. Uh, this is designed to slow the rocket down as it re-enters Earth's atmosphere. Then just a couple minutes later, we'll perform the final burn, also known as the landing burn, and that will decelerate the vehicle to a gentle landing on top of our drone ship. So there's the visual confirmation of that re-entry burn. This will last for another 10 seconds. Okay, so now that re-entry burn has ended, we have less than a minute until that third and final landing burn will happen followed Stage by a touchdown. One FTS has Now, as we uh, approach our first stage landing, I'd like to point out that we might lose video coverage uh, out there on our drone ship. There's lots of vibrations as the rocket is coming down towards it, so we might lose our satellite signal. Uh, if this is the case, we'll be sure to provide you status updates on that first stage as they become available. Uh, we're certainly excited to hear about it here in Hawthorne as, um, and across all of SpaceX as this is the third time, the first time that we have are trying to land us for a third time. So there we can see that final landing burn happening. We'll be looking for deployment of the landing legs here momentarily. ship just read the instructions which is currently out in the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> That's so great. And the first the second stage is still continuing on with the primary mission though. We are uh, eight minutes and 32 seconds into flight, and the second stage is still burning nominally. It's on a really good trajectory. Power is looking good, chamber pressures are good, and we're looking at 200,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space with that engine. So the second engine cutoff, or SECO, that's where we're going to stop burning this engine because ideally Falcon 9 will be in its intended deployment orbit. orbit. That's coming up in about 50 seconds. So as we mentioned earlier, we won't be able to show the deployments of the satellites today because this will be happening, uh, that will be taking place okay. over areas where we don't have ground station coverage. So unfortunately, we won't have any live video feed to provide. Um, because deployment won't be viewable, we will end our live webcast soon after the second engine cutoff. But please continue to follow along on SpaceX Twitter updates for payload deployment as they become available. All right, we should be expecting Seco, and there it is.
Let's Take listen in for whether or not the orbit's good. And we have confirmation that stage two has reached a good orbit. This is the deployment orbit, and the next step over the course of the next 40 minutes or so is to separate the payloads from the second stage of Falcon 9. And with that, we have reached the conclusion of our webcast today. Please continue to follow on on SpaceX Twitter for real-time updates on the rest of this mission, including oh, deployment of the satellites on board today. Thank you to our customer Spaceflight for entrusting us with today's launch, and to the United States Air Force's 30th Space Wing for range support. And a special thanks to the FCC, the NTIA, and NASA Spectrum Office for helping making today's flight possible. Be sure to continue to follow along with future SpaceX milestones. Uh, check out our website and social media feeds. Also, be sure to check us out for our next flight, CRS-16, a NASA cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station. And that's currently targeted for tomorrow, December 4th, at 1.38 p.m. Eastern out of Cape Canaveral, Florida. And with that, from, here, from all of us here at SpaceX, have a great day. launch that we've seen all together this great launch and that everything went fine until now so hopefully the voyage of move two will go on um, that's move how it went so far so um, and so that we know a bit more about um, the move two project we will now have a presentation about the overview and some subsystems and the teams of move two and therefore, I will please Martin Langer and Sebastian Rückel onto the stage so that they will hold the presentation. So they are both the, um, the leads of the project, the manager of Move2, and Martin did it from the very beginning. He initiated this project and followed us until now and led it us unto, until now. And uh, Sebastian Rückel is now this, uh, the lead of our project. So give a good applause. So, thank you, and uh, again, welcome also from my side, and um, I'm really, really happy now that we saw this uh, successful launch. Let's hope that everything that's happening now is also as successful as the launch was, and uh, meanwhile, and for the next minutes, we're going to give you an introduction on Move2, what systems are actually in this satellite, what Move2 is, so that all of us really know what we just uh, saw and why are we re even here? So, first of all, Move2 is a CubeSat. You all might have heard a CubeSat, and it's a really small thing, but uh, to imagine that a little bit better, a CubeSat is just this size. Like, the small thing down here is actual scale model of our satellite. And a CubeSat is not just a small thing, but it's a real satellite, a satellite with all the systems you need for uh, operating in space and doing real science there, doing uh, other missions like communications uh, missions or anything you can do with a big satellite to some extent, but on a smaller platform that's easier to get, that's easier to develop and launch into space. But Move2 for us is not just a CubeSat. Move2 is also to big parts, the team that is behind. And I'm really, really happy that I can work with this team, with this awesome team, with all of you uh, that are here now or in uh, Vandenberg or somewhere else uh, to uh, enjoy this launch and that had this great time with me together, with us together here at the chair building the satellite. But now coming to the CubeSat itself, I'm going to give you also some technical details, what we built there. First of all, again, it's just 10 centimeters. So that's something you have always uh, to keep in your mind while thinking about it. We had to put all those systems, all the effort into just this small cube, just a one liter volume. In there is our 
computer, a Linux-based system. We have an attitude determination and control system to uh, control how the uh, satellite orients in its orbit. We have a deployment that's based on shape memory alloy. We have our communication and the <laughs> UHF VHF, so the ham frequencies, and also in the S band to um, achieve higher data rates. We have solar cells on our satellite that give us the power to feature all those functionalities and to support all the other systems with a 12 watt peak, which is not that much as you might know. And we of course also have a payload. So we have new solar cells uh, that are measured how they perform up there in space. And all those things were built starting off with our CDH, so the command and data handling system, which is a computer, which is the computer of our satellite. And it is somehow the heart of the satellite because it controls how everything uh, works in there. And uh, yeah. Works. Yeah, and from my side also, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, and if, to give you a chance to get to know all the all the students and also the expert that helped us developing CDH, uh, please all the CDH member come out here, get in front of the audience, and get an applause. <laughs> so, I guess <laughs> some of the team is missing. Yeah, very good. So Alex is currently sitting in um, the Netherlands watching. So he was the team lead. And Carl is actually in Vandenberg. So he's also not here today. So thank you very much for your hard work. Uh, I know it was um, tough work, um, a lot of things to do. And as Sebastian said, it's the heart of the satellite. So um, you did a great job making our satellite alive. Thank you very much. Okay, so that was just the first system, and there are more to come. Next one is our EPS, our power supply, and this is also a very essential system. It's uh, needed to provide the power, and not only to provide it, but also to use the solar cells, use it to charge the batteries, control how those are charged and uh, discharged, monitor the state of the whole uh, charge and the system itself, and therefore feature the power for everything else that's going on in the system. So again, uh, please, all the EPS members, come out here. I've seen Rupert somewhere. <laughs> Patrick as well over there. I'm not sure if experts are here that helped us. So if you're an expert and helped us reviewing the system, please also come out here. That's the two members of EPS right now. So, we might say that already almost, or more than 200 people, students were developing the satellite. So, um, also more members were working on the EPS system. And I guess a few of them can't be here today, but we'll watch the live stream right now. So, thank you very much for your great work. And the next system is also a really great subsystem that did a lot of work and did a great job. And that's our ADCS system, so the Attitude Determination and Control System. That is the system that makes sure that the satellite is in a known position, in a known attitude in its orbit. And that also enables our sun pointing later on, which is really necessary or I would say at least a great thing to help us to achieve the power income we would really need and uh, yeah maybe maybe one more detail um, in my opinion the ADCS was was 
the system where we um, did most in the satellite maybe, where we had the biggest step, the biggest leap forward. In the first move, we had a passive ADCS system built on magnets. So in move two, for the first time, we're trying out to control our attitude actively, which is a lot of work. It's a lot of work in hardware, it's a lot of work in software, and it's especially a lot of work to test. So the picture right on the top, you, you can see the satellite hanging in our Helmholtz cage where we can simulate the magnetic field and test its attitude um, for later space use. So please, all of the ADCS members come out here and also ADCS experts. So you can also see it's a fairly big team, but for building an active ADCS, you need a lot of a lot of good guys. You need a lot of uh, work, and I think they did an amazing job. Thank you. Okay, going on from there, we come to the next system, the communication system, and it enables us to talk to the satellite. So it provides the link that is needed so that we can receive the beacon data, the data from our satellite, and also required to command it. And the system not only consists of the UHF, VHF, but also the S-band system, so it's also kind of, I would say, a payload where we try out new stuff in space. And it's, I think, also a very interesting development of us, where we, uh, with an expert from, from downtown Munich with Rolf Dieter, developed um, two software-defined radios uh, where we can change a lot of parameters, even if we're up in space. So also very complicated, and um, that's why I want to especially thank uh, all the guys involved in Com system. Please come out here, and also the experts. Please come out here as well. So, <laughs> maybe one minor detail. Um, Sebastian was leading the comm team before he yeah, got employed by the management. <laughs> <laughs> it's a downgrade, I suppose. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so the next system we're going to have is our real payload. And this payload, as I said before, consists of a number of solar cells that we're going to uh, characterize in space and where we want to see how they perform and also how they perform over time. And I think that's, that shows that we can really do something scientific with a satellite that is that small. And, yeah. and by, by measuring those cells, um, they can be used in bigger satellites as well. So the cell size itself, it's the same if you're using a small satellite like we do or if you use a big satellite. So by measuring that and measuring the degradation, we can really do important work for future satellites, also big ones, like communication satellites, shown by Professor Walter. So great work by the, um, by the payload team and also a very good support by Airbus and Azure Space in terms of that. Thank you very much. And please come out here, also the experts. <laughs> okay. 
and Lucas in the middle, he's he, he, he was always our payload lead, and um, he's now also leading the, the, the student team of Move2, so I guess also an upgrade or downgrade. Either way, thank you very much. Okay, going on from there, we come to the structure, a uh, really, really important system, especially as they built our deployment system that is uh, necessary for the satellite to really end up with this windmill shape. And they did also a really, really great job in building the system, making it reliable, and making all this possible. And one thing we are gonna fly for the first time in here is a shape memory alloy. So um, that's new. Um, we were able to test uh, the mechanism, um, which was built a um, longer time ago, and we were able to test it and not destroy it in our lab. So uh, we got pretty confident that it will really work. And um, one of the first things uh, Move2 will do after deployment, which will happen in approximately four and a half hours, is um, it will deploy its uh, PALs. So we'll then see if the, the work of, of Till and all the others from structure team will work out at the end. So please come out here and also please experts come, come out here and, and get a hand for your great work. <laughs> and one detail you can also see in the picture over there is a CubeSat. Um, it's also very complicated because it's that small. So you have to fit in all the different subsystems the satellite need in a, in a fairly small size. And that was partly the job of the structural system, subsystem, and also part of AIT. So I think you did a great job um, making that happen because it's, it's a very tight volume. And yeah, as I said, you have to fit in all the subsystems you need. Thank you. So the next subsystem, even though they are not uh, flying themselves, is our systems engineering team. And this is really one of the core teams, I would say, that made it possible that our satellite is really the satellite we wanted to build in the first place. And also, it works in the end. So once we stick all the parts together, it works. And uh, this is a really, really great achievement. And thanks to the SE team, this was possible. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Just come out here, the SE team. Where are the SE members? <laughs> Experts. <laughs> is it just you? OK. Oh, yeah. And you have to know, we, we, we teach systems engineering here. Professor Walter is teaching systems engineering here at our institute. So you can learn it as a student, theoretically. But I, I think doing that job in the project is completely different. It's really hard work. And you have to bug a lot of people. You have to like, talk to a lot of people. And I think, especially you, Florian, you did a great job. And without you, we, don't, we wouldn't have a satellite today. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, that was my bad, <laughs> but that's not the end. We also have an AIT team, so you might wonder what is AIT. The name already that up there says it. It's assembly testing, integrate integration of our satellite. So what you can see there is basically our satellite, but not really our satellite. It's just lying there on the table in pieces, and those guys were the ones that made it possible that all, all those pieces fit together in the end. And those also were the guys that could manage to assemble the satellite. And that's really a great achievement for so many pieces on just one liter of volume. And since they did such a great job, 
um, we're now certifying students for doing AIT. So Michael and Patrick, both on the left of the photo, they can now certify other students how to assemble and disassemble and test the satellite. So please, all of you, come out here. Thank you very much. Coming next is also equally important. I would say it's our operations team. And the ops team is the team that developed and uh, created our awesome ops interface that we can now use to control our satellite and to hopefully successfully finish the mission and all our objectives just from any computer in here. And this is a really, really important and a great job they did there as without the system it would be really hard to work with the satellite. And as you can imagine, it, it requires a lot of testing. So not only is it programmed completely by students, you can see here, um, it was also tested for a lot of time, make, making sure that it will really work at the end of the day with our satellite in space. Um, so please, also the operations team member come out here. Um, Alex, also to the left, was leading the system. He is, as I said, currently at the Netherlands working for ESA. So Alex, if you're listening, thank you very much. And all the others just come out here. Thank you. That's enough for lips, okay? One one thing I forgot. Um, so we we probably in a few weeks we're gonna make this interface accessible for the public. So you can watch the satellite where it is, you can see the temperatures, you can see where it goes, and that's also part of the great work the operations team did. Thank you. And as Martin just said, you can also see the temperatures here. That's basically the temperatures in our ops interface. But what I wanna say for the thermal team is not that they built the ops interface, but they, they made sure that our thermal budget is really working, that our satellite is not overheating, and at the same time, it's not freezing to death, because both are potential risks in space. And they did a great job there, uh, not only simulating what we will expect in space, but also testing it heavily in our thermal vacuum camera and uh, making really sure that we will survive up there. So do we have any member of the thermal team here today? Because Katya, who was leading the team. Research. Yeah, she's in, I know that. <laughs> she, she is also working at ESA. So thank you, Katya. And I guess, uh, yeah, Michi and Siri, they're, they're, Michi is also not here right now. And Siri is in California watching the launch. So is there any expert here from the thermal? Yep. Yeah, Nikolai. Yeah. So yeah, we have one. <laughs> we have one to thank. And that's maybe a good chance to explain a um, working principle we had in Move 2 and we will also have in the future. So we involved um, over 30 external experts that helped us a lot developing those subsystems and developing all the ideas we had. That's very important because we need external knowledge, we need the uh, experts from the industry because um, they have knowledge and experience we don't have. So thank you very much once more for your involvement and thank you to all the experts out there for helping us. Coming next is our mission control team. And you might say, yeah, they, they are not really building the satellite, but that's not really totally true. They are also essential part there. They are part of testing what's going on, as we didn't say mission control starts once the satellite is in orbit. No, mission control starts once you have the first model of the satellite and you want to control it, even though it's in your lab. And they did a great job in there, testing it, 
training what we're going to have once we are in orbit. And I'm really, really sure they're also going to do a great job in the next days, weeks, months, maybe years of uh, the mission lifetime of MOVE2. Thank you. How about you, all the mission control members? <laughs> Experts and members? So tomorrow, slightly before 10 o'clock, we get the first pass of Move 2, and hopefully we get a lot of signals, and hopefully you have a lot of work to do by then. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
who worked on the satellite, please come up front to take a final picture. Please come up front. <laughs> come in the front. All people having worked on the satellite, please come up and drop around so we can pick, take a beautiful picture. Please get down in front. So we have uh, several levels. Please carry it down. Move together a little bit. Move together. Any more? Look here. This is a team. They made it work. Please give a big applause to our team, Move 2. Thank you. Woo. You are now allowed to take pictures, please. And it's me finally to thank really every one of you. I'm proud of you. You did a very good work. I'm really proud of you. And we hopefully, we hope that it will fly. Thank you very much. <laughs>
but we will be able to hear it earliest tomorrow around 10 o'clock. So um, if you're at TU Munich, you can uh, come and see us doing that. We will also probably broadcast it. Um, and of course, we will send out um, news from time to time what is going on in space with Move2. So thank you very much all for coming. Um, and that's the Move introduction presentation, I, gu I guess. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Martin and Basti. So, yeah, we also want to thank you as the Move2 team because it was not always easy. It, as we already heard from Professor Walter, we had so many problems and you kept us motivating. So that was really what we brought us fo forward and that we got to a finished satellite that now is on a voyage into space. So thank you. <laughs> we have also a small <laughs> present for you. That's for you. <laughs> and a smoky one for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think, um, yeah, applause. <laughs> <laughs> and as it is uh, so late now, I think we will just go on with our um, plan. Um, actually, we have now a small presentation about the history of Move2. It was not only the Move project began with first Move, and now we will see how it continues and how it evolved so that we had our Move2 CubeSat we saw on the pictures before. So, and once again, I want to um, ask Martin to give the presentation. So, again, applause for Martin. <laughs> Thank you. So I guess I was chosen since I'm the oldest team member or something like that. And <laughs> that's not a thing to applaud. <laughs> so I'm not sure if you have the energy. I, I guess uh, it will take me like roughly three hours to describe the full story, maybe four, um, beginning in 2011. No, I'm going to do a quick presentation. If you have more questions to that, please approach me after that. So um, it all started with first move, and it really started in 2006 when a former member of our institute um, said he wanted he wanted to build a CubeSat, and um, Professor Walter supported him, and we built that CubeSat and uh, later launched it in 2013. And the first ideas for move two, for move on, doing something further than first move, um, were created in late 2011. And up here, you can see the original presentation given by Professor Walter. So we found that, <laughs> which is pretty cool. And you can also notice um, it was a two-unit CubeSat when we first created it. So it was double the size we have now. Then, um, yeah, there was the first general meeting of our VAR satellite technology team um, concluding that they want to build a CubeSat. And in 2012, there were a lot of first concepts dealing either with satellite communication or anti-proton detection, so that was a detector. And it is still a detector built by the physics department of our university. And um, yeah, we said in 2012, we want to fly the anti-proton detector again on a two-unit mission. Really, really complicated. So standing here now, I'm really happy that we didn't do it. So there were a lot of kickoffs um, and the first mission concept review in uh, May 2013, and that was the, the first real team picture we had of the Move2 team. So um, I guess, I'm not sure if you can see it, but there are a lot of folks still around. So uh, we really benefited a lot from team members staying in our team for a long time. And I think that was a very important goal we achieved in Move2. As I said, we launched first Move 21st of November 2013. Um, remember it as it was yesterday. So it was early in the morning, not, not as today. And uh, that was the crowd for the first move launch. So I think we expanded that. <laughs> it's good. Uh, yeah, so the launch was successful, deployment successful. And later on, we, we got the first signal and operated also the, signal, the satellite for a um, little bit less than one month. And really, we learned a lot of lessons in first move. It's, it's uh, extremely hard to build a CubeSat and especially doing it for the first time. So we learned a lot of valuable lessons from that mission. So in 2014, uh, we spent a lot of time developing stuff, developing hardware with the um, small budget we had, 
developing our two-unit mission, working with um, amateur radio assistance from other institutes here at, at, at Garching, which really helped us, um, but also doing barbecue from time to time. And then, um, yeah, in early uh, 2015, we successfully launched our shape memory alloy mechanism on our Rexos mission. So this mechanism really dates back uh, more than three years ago. And then in April 2015, um, we started um, developing the one unit satellite. You maybe ask yourself why a one unit satellite. So we got only funding for one unit satellite by the DLR, which we're really happy of. So um, I'm really happy that we got that funding. Um, and basically, they told us to make a one-unit CubeSat um, for education, so to build a one-unit satellite with students, but also to have some kind of scientific payload on there and also some kind of technological payload. And what you just have seen in our presentation was like the things we fly on that mission. We had the first system design review on um, November 2015, and um, yeah, a lot of crazy stuff was going on there, so a lot of concepts, a lot of ideas, um, but not really um, a fixed satellite, of course. Yeah, that's the photo of the, of the smart student team. So um, I think also our, our satellite was benefiting a lot of um, high altitude rockets and high altitude balloons and testing hardware really in the uh, space-like environment. So end of 2015, we got accepted with our transceivers uh, for a BEXUS campaign, which is a high altitude balloon uh, flying in northern Sweden. And um, in end of 2015, with the help of uh, Martin and Airbus and Astro Space, we got the first idea of what kind of payload we can fit into that small one unit size. Yeah, and in March 2016, it was important for us that we had the, the rebirth of the Move to Systems Engineering team. So um, in between March 2016 and I would say March 2015, we didn't have a real SE team at all. That was a very important step for us. And then um, we moved very quickly. So in June 2016, we had our preliminary, preliminary design review and a lot of experts helped us with that. So we had our first design of the satellite, which really looks a lot like the satellite we finally built. And that is good, in my opinion. And we also did a nice team shot. And you can see here, um, over the time, the, the team grew. So I guess um, in mid of 2016, we were about 40 people in the team. and that grew to, um, I think, over 100 at the maximum. And also we had nice um, prototypes for testing our solar panel deployment, for testing our um, all different subsystems, which was really important for us. And you can see a lot of prototypes right here. So you can see a prototype from the ADCS team. So that's the so-called print set, where it tested a lot of stuff. Um, it's really cool. You can see a prototype of the AIT team, which is a 3D printed satellite where it tested um, if the satellite is really uh, fitting together. You can see a thermal prototype where we tested if the thermal um, assembly really works in space. Um, and you can see a nice uh, prototype for, for PR purposes. So it's just um, made out of, of, of wood and some aluminum structures. And over here you can see that, again, as I said, the, the team, it, it grew over time. So that's probably, yeah, end of 2016, maybe 70, 80 people there. And then, yeah, we created the first, the student of us created the first mission patch. Um, and we have really a good student for doing that. He, he does a really amazing job for all the mission patches we have. They're really beautiful. And I know a lot of other <laughs> patches from other teams. <laughs> so thank you, Michi, if you're listening right now. Um, and then, um, as I said before, uh, we had to do a lot of testing um, for our satellite. And one of the major tests for us was detumbling test. So when the satellite um, is going out of the deployer, so the satellite itself is now currently sitting in a deployer, which is looking like a shoebox, and it gets ejected in like three hours from now. Um, when it gets ejected, it tumbles. So one of the first things you have to achieve is to detumble the satellite, to slow it down. And you have to test that a lot. And for that, we had to do a lot of um, ADCS, so I did you determination and control system detumbling tests. And that's what you can see up here and down here. So that's a Helmholtz cage where you can simulate a magnetic field, 10 times the magnetic field of the Earth. And that's, again, the so-called print set with ADC has hardware on it, or where we can um, produce the magnetic field we really have on our satellite. Again, as I said, it was very important for us to launch real hardware on balloons. So we launched our communication system 
on the BAXIS mission from Sweden. And this BAXIS mission, it floated up to, I guess, 40 kilometers, roughly, and stayed there for more than two hours. So we were really able to test our communication system, the antennas, uh, through the atmosphere at a very narrow angle. And that was really good because it's pretty hard on the ground to test your communication system for something that is going up to space. Again, we had a, a refounding event. So our operation system, subsystem, um, so the ops system was refounded by Alex, which was also very important for us. Um, and down here, you can see um, all the ADCS tests going on again. And if you're interested in seeing that room, it's just one floor downstairs. And most of the students did their hard work there. End of 2016, we had our critical design review. Um, again, we got a lot of help um, from external experts that took a critical look at our design. And with the help of them, we were able to finalize our design and really um, get the things going and start building our engineering model and our flight model. So we also had, <laughs> that's a funny thing to tell. Maybe not funny for the team members anymore, but <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so we, um, after the CDR, we, um, the management implemented an artificial milestone. We called it the Christmas milestone. And we set up nice contracts for each subsystem where all team members had to sign what to achieve before Christmas. And that led to some people sleeping in the office. That le it led to really hard work. But finally, we were really able to achieve almost all of the points on that list. And I think um, seeing it now, without the Christmas milestone, we wouldn't have been able to build the satellite. <laughs> so I think the student members, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the feedback. <laughs> Um, yeah, and that's the Christmas milestone, so um, a lot of pizza eating stuff going on there very well. We began the ops implementation in January 2017, and that's pretty late if you think about the ops uh, as something that you want to test with the real satellite for a long enough time. And only with the great work of the ops um, members, we were able to achieve what we have today. And in February 2017, we, we began testing our engineering model. And if you ask yourself, what is an engineering model? An engineering model um, is an exact copy of the flight models of, of the satellite that goes up into space. But you build it before the real satellite and test it much more than the flight model. And the thing you saw in the, in the previous presentation about the hill interface, that's our engineering model right now. So we still have it in our clean room. Um, if you want to, you can probably have a look through the window later on and see what a real satellite looks like. And then um, we did a lot of LEOP tests, um, which means a lot of testing going on for the really early phase of the satellite, because um, it's a very critical phase. As I said, it's um, the satellite detumbling, the satellite booting up, the satellite sending its first signals. So I guess the first 24 hours of our satellite, which they will be the, the, the most important of, of our lifetime of the satellite. So beginning of tomorrow, um, yeah, it's 24 hours for us where we have to achieve a lot of stuff. Then we did a lot of 24-hour tests where we ran the satellite for a whole day, uh, multiple ones, and we also did a first integration of the satellite. So up until then, we had the satellite in a so-called flat set, which you can see here. So all the subsystems in a flat um, envelope. And then we integrated the satellite for the first time. And of course, it, it didn't work perfectly. So we had to do it again and again. And then uh, it worked. And later, we were able to test the EM in thermal vacuum for the first time. And what you can see here is Alex and Katya and Patrick sitting at the thermal vacuum chamber during the night. So we had to, to man the TVEC chamber for, I, I think it was almost two weeks, with people 24-7. So that was only achievable with a great team. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Didn't know that. <coughs> so what you can see in the top left window is the satellite detumbling. It hangs in the Helmholtz cage, and we can switch off and on the magnetic coils of its side panels, decelerating and accelerating it. 
So that's the real test of the satellite with the real hardware in a almost space environment. And that's the thing you want to achieve. On the right picture, oh yeah. <laughs> Not sure if we're allowed to show that by the way, but yeah. That's shaker tests and um, tests of the structural subsystems. We did that with IABG. So we did um, tests on the shaker simulating the vibration of the rocket launch you just saw, and also testing the satellite in a centrifuge simulating the acceleration. And both tests are important to, to prove that your satellite can survive the launch loads. Later, we did the first integration of the FM, the flight mall. So that thing on the left is the real satellite, which was launched into space an hour ago, and that to the right is our engineering model. And as I said, it's an exact copy, so both satellites are the same. And we later also did FM shaker tests, and we did our first team photo, and our first team photo with the whole um, team um, and move shirts, and we had a good barbecue there. All about barbecues. Ah. Okay, so, and then, um, almost coming to an end, we had another uh, artificial milestone, and maybe you want to tell again about this milestone, Sebastian? No, no feelings about that. Okay, it's a D-Day milestone. <laughs> it was an artificial milestone like the Christmas milestone where we defined that D-Day, Decision Day, up until then, we want to finish everything. And that was also important for us. Yeah, thank, thank, thank Martin Turer for that. <laughs> We later did an, an, e, an FM TVEC test campaign. It's also important to test your satellite in thermal vacuum, also to prove and to show to yourself that it's able to survive um, the space environment. And then uh, another, another chapter of MOVE began. We launched the first stratosphere balloon ourselves. So it's called MOVE ON, um, and we're launching um, every half a year since then, we're launching high altitude balloons with um, technical payloads which we self-developed and we test them at the edge of the space. So that's really important for us and it's really good that we have this ability now also for future satellite missions. And you can see an actual photo taken by the balloon over there and the, the first um, move on team working hard towards uh, the launch of the balloon. We found our mission control team pretty late, so a year ago, um, and then we, uh, we straight began with the operators training. So we began to train how to operate the satellite in space with the satellite sitting in the clean room and with the whole communication chain between us and the satellite. And that was also really important for us because with such tests, you, you're able to see um, problems in the different areas. So imagine your the satellite now being up in space and you suddenly face a problem. You're not sure if the problem is on the satellite itself, if it's in between you and your communication antennas, if it's maybe the communication system on the ground, or if it's your operating system on the ground. So it's really important to do a lot of tests to be able to verify that it really works at the end of the day. And then we did a final test campaign uh, until June 2018 with a lot of further tests, also uh, with the real sun going out there, um, with the artificial sun, so we borrowed an old projector to do that, and um, also d streaming it live to our missions operations interface to test all the things we did outside. Then we did our final integration. So we assembled, and that's AIT, they assembled the satellite for the last time, and almost all of the team members signed the satellite. So congratulations to the team members. You have your signature now up in space. And that's a fast forward video of Michael and Patrick assembling the satellite. So I'm not sure how long it took you. Is it like an hour? <laughs> More like three hours, okay. But you were drinking coffee sometimes, right? Not coffee, okay. Okay. And to the bottom right, you can see a big Move 2 model, which was put in place by art students downtown in Munich. And it's now standing outside there. You can, now you can not walk in, but if it has the, the wings up, you can walk in there, which is pretty cool. They're still working. <laughs> As I said, it's 
pretty complicated to fit everything in. So it's pretty complicated to fit every subsystem into that tight volume. And if you're asking yourself what kind of stuff is it on the solar cells right here, <laughs> <laughs> they're happy. If you're asking yourself what kind of stuff is it up here, um, it's also important for AIT not only to integrate the satellite, but also to not destroy it during integrating it. And that's protection for the solar cells because it's, it's very, very easy to, to destroy your solar cells because they're very thin. So our AIT team, they're very good in not destroying anything. So thank you for that. Uh, but that's just further measures put in place and also uh, put in place by you, which was very good. Then we did some last farewells. So we actually had to transport the satellite to our launch provider end of July. So we did a team photo. Um, yeah, we had the, both of the satellites with us, of course, in two different cars. So you have to make sure that one of the satellites is really reaching um, the Netherlands where we had to bring it. And then um, we had our delivery and integration campaign in the Netherlands. And what you can see here is move two in the clean room uh, at the company where we bought our launch. Um, and that's um, the other satellite that's with us in the box. It's a satellite from Poland called PVSat2. And um, yeah, we also did some final charging a little bit later on because the launch was delayed. But that's uh, another story. It was delayed several times, so it's a long story. Um, and also important as a sideline, we also did a kickoff of move to b in early September this year. And if you're asking yourself what, what, what is move to b you might see it from the logo. Um, we're, we're rebuilding move 2 So we're rebuilding the, the whole system, and we're going to launch it in March on a Soyuz rocket from Russia. Um, and we did that to make sure that the system is really working in space, because you always have the chance that the, the rocket explodes. It didn't do it, so <laughs> we're good now. But uh, again, we're going to rebuild it and launch it in the Soyuz and get more scientific data and more data from our subsystem from space, which is pretty good. And you have seen that. So that's um, probably the end. Now nah, I have another good slide. So that's not the end. That was the launch with a lot of nice logos. But I think ours still looks the best. Um, and that how it, that's a picture from Vandenberg if you're on the I think on the south and, and can see the launch, but you're not able to go there for watching. Um, that's an interesting chart, and probably a few of you have seen it. That's the uh, weekly average members active on Slack. Slack is our communication system, and you can see um, spikes going up from time to time where a lot of team members were communicating with each other. So up here is 80, and down here is the time. So a lot of things was going on before CDR and the Xmas milestone, and then suddenly, I don't know for what for what reason uh, nothing happened. <laughs> nah, I think all the team members were exhausted and making some vacation. And then, um, yeah, you can see if you do an average, we have roughly 60 team members on average communicating all the time on Slack. So I said in the beginning we have um, more than 200 team members, more than 200, 200 students involved in Move2. And uh, I think we can really be proud of that achievement. And you can be proud of yourself being part of that big student team and achieving really a satellite that went up into space. And thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you especially to all the students who worked really hard during the last seven years. Uh, and I think um, with such students, uh, we can do a lot of great missions in the future. And I'm really happy to be here and work with you. Thank you very much. One, one last thing, thank you to Lucy for the nice slides. <laughs>So thank you very much. So we have one presentation left, but before we do this, I think we make a short break. So get some drinks again, go to a toilet or whatever, and we will start in five minutes with the last presentation and the official ending. So see you in five minutes.
So we heard about what happened up to now. We have a few nice presentation about what is MOVE, but now what's happened now? Because it's launched, what's next? So, and this will tell us Flo. So please listen to him as the last presentation for today. Thank you very much for all those still bearing with us. Uh, my name is Flo, I'm the former lead of the systems engineering team that is right now handled by Jan, who is somewhere, I don't see him, doesn't matter. There, yeah. Um, yeah, and so since back in the days it was my task to actually design what the satellite is doing now, I'm also telling you about it. And, well, frankly, we already have this one, it's passed. And this presentation is stolen from here and there, so I will just present some slides that I copied and ripped from other people. Um, this one is actually from Spaceflight themselves, so the company that bought the rocket. And here you see all those nice satellite deployers. So, for example, this is a larger satellite. These are CubeSat stacks from ISIS, so also from the company where we integrated our satellite. And I actually stole it on the small satellite conference. Um, yeah. Back in the days, they thought that they would launch 70 plus spacecraft. This was um, someone in the beginning of August. Now we already know that this is not the case. So from the beginning of August until now, space business is hard, it stays hard. It only made 64 satellites here. Um, you see that there are quite some university spacecraft which are about the most spacecraft together with tech demonstration. Apart from that, there's imaging spacecraft um, and some more, but yeah, still we make up about the largest proportion. So what actually happened on the rocket about five to ten minutes ago, if I'm not mistaken, is they deployed the upper free flyer and the lower free flyer. So we already got the update from SpaceX that you were reading that this deployment actually was successful, which is a good thing for us to happen. Um, what are those free flyers? They're called free flyers because actually they don't do anything apart from fly around in orbit by themselves. They don't have attitude control. The only thing they have is a little bit of command sequence programmed in. And they're actually very, very stupid. This was a design goal. They built it as stupid as possible in order to not have it fail due to complicated functions. Um, so what we already had is the launch until here. We had the deployment of the upper free flyer, of the lower free flyer. And what is actually a pity for us is we're on the lower free flyer. Um, the upper free flyer is getting proper TLEs via GPS, etc., PP, and for us the life stays a little bit more interesting and difficult since we are on the lower free flyer. Uh, we do not get TLEs from orbit in advance. We have to make a round. TLE are the orbital parameters, so they actually tell you where your spacecraft is, and they're approximately re uh, reliable for the next one to two weeks. Um, I'm not that good at this, I had a three point something in my orbit mechanics exam, but don't <laughs> tell the professor. <laughs> and yeah, this is what they actually look like. You see there are some larger spacecraft stored here. And here you see the lower free flyer. Um, there are lots of CubeSat deployers all around it. It's a little bit smaller than the upper free flyer and it just hands out all the rest. This is some small video from space flight itself, also stolen from them where you can see how actually all the hardware is assembled that is by now already being distributed throughout space everywhere. So while we are sitting here, parts of the spacecraft you see integrated here are actually being deployed. So first we had the upper free flyer separation. Um, it's quite interesting. You have this large ring going around which is filled up with explosives. Uh, it's a very traditional way of how to separate spacecraft from each other. Also, here you see these rings are pretty much the same. They're from a company called MOOC, which makes great parties. And yeah, here you see CubeSat deployments from the upper free flyer. They don't have an animation of the lower free flyer. And anyways, it's just computer animation, so. What happens afterwards is this is not used anymore. It's space debris. So the question is what to do with it. Um, 
actually we are lucky enough to not be on a real old space launch because they integrated some drag sails and they will put this down quite fast again. So it is not orbiting Earth for the next hundred years like Envisat, for example. What happens a little bit later at half past midnight is this. Once our satellite is ejected, the two smart mechanism that Till, who is sitting somewhere over there, designed, <laughs> um, will deploy. Hopefully, cross your fingers. In order to see this happening, a few things have to happen before that. First of all, when our satellite is pushed out of its box, there are two pins at the bottom that switch it off. If one of these pins is released, the satellite actually starts to operate. Don't ever tell anyone that there should be both pins released. We just programmed one of them because it's more reliable for us and less for the spacecraft. <laughs> what happens some while after that is this. The radio of our satellite actually starts to operate. Um, you don't hear much right now because this is what exactly everyone else will hear too. There's not much. And it takes forever. And we don't know when. At some point, it will just start to beep. But I guess it's not on there. Um, the next part that will happen is somewhere tonight, we estimate around 2 o'clock in the morning. We will get updated TLEs for the lower free flyer, hopefully. We're not 100% sure about this. Um, it was promised to us, but so were other things in the past, and so we're uh, reluctant to believe this information. And what you see here is the actual information on the last update we got. So they usually come per email, so someone in 2 a.m. in the morning, Basti or uh, Martin will have to check, or eventually they'll just check in the morning because it doesn't make any difference anymore. And yeah, you have all the parameters that we need to actually calculate our orbit properly and thereby also propagate when the overpasses are. So this is why we need this information because we have a pointing antenna and so also space about this ground station is large. We have to point in the right direction at the right time, be there, sit there and wait for it to actually do something, otherwise we won't notice it. And yeah, therefore we come to what happens next, the expectations for the first operations. As I already said, we have a ground station on the roof, which is uh, quite lucky for us. And what you see here is the cone of our ground station. So the antenna we have, it is able to just pinpoint a certain part of the sky, which is good because it sees that a lot more clearly like a microscope or telescope, for example. Optimally, the satellite would just occur. Um, we track it all the way over the first overpass already because we know exactly where it is, and thereby we're lucky. What happened during first movement, which we learned from, is this. You're tracking and tracking and tracking. The satellite is one and a half minutes behind you, and you're gone. So what we learned from that is the installation of a second ground station that is not officially uh, added somewhere, which is why I can't tell you its exact location, but I guess you can read. Um, and it's an omnidirectional ground station. So the advantage of that is it does not need to point a certain area in space. It just listens all the time. And you heard that when operating in the beginning today, around 1815, when it recorded the first move overpass. So it completely doesn't matter where exactly move to is, as long as it's over us, the Black Mansa ground station will hear it. Therefore, we will just put our antenna in exactly the direction where we know that it is coming from. Some when it passes through, and when we see the signal weakening, we change the direction of the antenna. Not automated, all operated by hand, someone sitting there pressing buttons. Once this works and we actually got a link, um, the next part is to check the uplink, downlink, and nanolink connections and see how fast our link is, how reliable it is, and whether everything worked out that someone during his studies in about the eighth semester Nicholas calculated, and which nobody ever verified. Shokes aside. Um, it's <laughs> and this is 
This is where you see the joke, because right now it is a joke. It was verified by various reviewers throughout the industry who helped us a lot, and also from the DLR. If not, we'd be sitting here now, and I know lots of teams that did exactly this who did not have proper help, and that would have been a pity. Um, yeah, this is the second view that we'll actually see in the op screen that has any meaning to it. And as soon as we got the downlink and all our downlink infrastructure is working properly, the bytes are decoded, we will get this. Hopefully it looks as green as now. Because this would mean that actually everything is operating as expected. The next part that will happen is we will commission our control interface. So part of the operations interface is sending commands up and down. Um, which, in fact, is just running a Linux command line a little bit more complicated, but it's still exactly the same commands. You can send any commands you could send to a Linux computer. And in parallel to this, we refine our orbital estimations. So as already mentioned, the orbital parameters we have, they're not known, so we have to guess. Um, Martin and David have been breaking their heads about two weeks from now to just get a rough estimation of where it will show up and when, which is the more important part. And as soon as it comes by the first time, by doing Doppler shift corrections, calculating from the time it rises to the time it fell, we will somehow be able to estimate properly where exactly it is. We will use this information and refine it on the next overpasses, etc. pp. And what you see here before this is we will relieve the two smart of its duties. So the two smart, the till build, um, it's quite okay. We hope that it actually does its job, fingers crossed. And what you see here is the SMA spring that is put into it and it is being operated four times every 30 minutes until we tell it to stop. This is again building a machine as simple as stupid to make it actually work. So we don't care whether the spring breaks because if it's already there and it did its job once it can break, we don't mind. So we just let it run for hours until it comes by here and we see that it did its job. Yeah, so apart from that, what is making the whole thing interesting is there's more than 51 customers on our launch. It's over 14 countries involved, 50, uh, 65 satellites and two free flying units. So we'll see lots of stuff in the spectrum and we'll have to find our satellite somewhere in it. Um, which is quite a challenge. Back in the days, you had five satellites on launch, or six, or just two, or one. Not that difficult to find it. Now there's just too many. And the other question is, what are we doing after that? Um, there are quite some ideas, and they're put here with these nice bubbles, because somehow it all depends. So we've been doing this not because it is simple and we know that it will work out from the very beginning, but because lots of the stuff is highly experimental. And therefore, we will just see what exactly worked within the next 24 hours, which is giving me the creeps. And after that, we will decide on what exactly is coming next. That's about it. Thank you very much. And before I, hand oh. before I hand the microphone over, I wanted to add one last thing. Uh, it's not on the slides, and it somehow didn't fit anywhere properly. But I still remember how during the critical design review of Move 2, you were there, you were there too, and lots of us were there. All our subsystems were designed pretty well, and you still recall Martin telling you the satellite still looks the same pretty much, which is good. There's one system that completely doesn't look the same, because before that, it was a blank page. And that is the software running in our onboard computer, which has been developed in absolute record time, architectured in the same record time by one person who afterwards started to lead two teams at the same time because he just couldn't get enough of it and he had so much fun in it and he didn't see it working out for all of us without his continued support and expertise. And therefore, although he's not here, there's a special applause for Alex.
Yeah, thank you, Flo, for this great presentation about what comes next in our um, Move2 team and what we will do and what will happen. Yeah, and now it's the time that we will um, talk about uh, the people who actually made this team and this satellite possible. So we want to say thank you to a lot of people in the official ending. Um, so um, first of all, the DLR um, is um, actually the key point for us because they financed us. They did us it g gave us the money so that we can build this satellite and that we can shoot it up into the space. So um, thank you for the deal R. But not always the money was enough. So we have a huge thank you to all sponsors who gave us a um, lot of stuff who always make it possible to build the satellite. Thank you very much to all sponsors. Also, very special thanks to the radio amateurs because um, they gave us trainings to do the radio amateur license. So we need that to operate our ground station here. And also we received a lot of help in our hardware development. And we are also using the ham frequencies, so th a great thanks to the radio amateurs. And of course, a big thanks to the LRT because we are using the rooms here. We have a lot of people from the LRT who is helping us. Thank you very much because without you it's not possible. Yeah, throughout the project, we had a lot of reviewers who uh, actually uh, had a look on what we are doing. And because yeah, we are students, we are, were developing the first time a satellite. So we did a lot of mistakes and they um, told us that we have to change something and to make our satellite really working. That was also the work from the reviewers and experts. Thanks for that. <laughs> We can't tell it often enough. Martin and Basti, thank you very much to be our project lead and bring us at this point built out to this would never be possible. Yeah, and finally, we want to thank the whole Move2 team who had so many hours uh, invested into this project. So thank you. You made it really real to build a satellite. Many said that you won't achieve it, but yeah, you did it. So thank you. <laughs> So now I would like to steal one more minute of your precious time with, uh, I would like to bother you with one tradition and another thank you. First, the tradition, the big space missions during the launch events, they typically have a cake with a picture on it depicting the spacecraft or the mission patch. And we have the greatest mission patch in the world. So we made a cake uh, with uh, the mission patch of Move2 on it. And we would like to dedicate it to the student leads of this project because they have really made this project unique and make me proud, prouder of uh, this team um, be because mo most educational satellite missions, they are doctoral candidates putting together a satellite, great thing, but uh, they involve students, may, maybe a dozen students, and we have been over 100 students at times, and the ones making that able are our student leaders, and these are Lukas Kempel, <laughs> David Messmann, <laughs> Nicolas Apel, <laughs> and now we come to the very old times, Johannes Gutsmiedel, if he is still here, and our very first student lead, Martin Jura. Thanks a lot to all of you.
Ja, das ist ja nicht Ja. Okay. Ja. So that is the official ending right now. So thank you all for coming. It was a great event and we are very happy that our satellite is now on its way into the orbit. Thank you all for coming and all for all the Move 2 members. There is some after party, I guess. So stick around then. <laughs> thank you. And dear student leads, Please now um, cut the cake and and feed the uh, feed the fleißiges move team. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>